Sometimes even good people can make a mistake. And when it happens, it's one of the most intense and emotional experiences of your life. It could be a DUI, or maybe you were in the wrong place with the wrong people at the wrong time. Or perhaps you just did something stupid at the spur of the moment without even thinking, and now you're in trouble with the law. Well, you need experienced legal help right away so you don't become a victim of the criminal justice system. Even good people can make a mistake, and if you, a friend or loved one, has been accused of a crime, don't make another mistake by hiring the wrong attorney for the kind of help you need. You need to visit ToddJohnsLaw.com. That's ToddJohnsLaw.com, and then call Attorney Todd Johns today. Attorney Todd Johns has decades of experience helping good people like you who have made mistakes or bad decisions and will stand by you every step of the way. ToddJohnsLaw.com. Judy's Journeys is an online travel agency specializing in family vacation planning. Now booking 2024 and 2025 vacation packages for theme parks, cruise lines, all-inclusive resorts, and more. Judy's Journeys books Disney hotel and resort packages, car rentals, excursions, and flights so that you can make amazing memories and enjoy all of the rides and attractions you love. Judy's Journeys also books universal vacation packages, all-inclusive resort vacations, cruises, and land tours for families and small groups. Family vacation doesn't just mean mom, dad, kids, and grandparents. It can also be a family-friendly environment for an adults-only vacation. Visit www.judysjourneys.net to book your next family vacation. Book before June 30th, 2024 to receive a free gift. And we thank Judy's Journeys for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. Your host, Bill Rader, and joining me as he does each and every week, right here on That's Enough Out of You podcast, is Sean Kane. Sean, what's going on? Billy Braids, how you doing, buddy? Doing good, can't complain. Lots of stuff going on. We've got a great show today, as usual, and we are um we're looking forward to the to the summer and uh hopefully nice weather. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't bad yesterday, uh, at least early in the day. You know, we, we and uh, Nate went down, worked with Jamie down at the office 5K race. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, and get the get the weekend kicked off, Billy. And uh, today's a lousy day weather-wise. Yeah. Raining, but we yeah. got work to do, Billy. We got podcasts. We got a big show. Um, You know, but before we get to our topic, Billy, just a couple housekeeping items. Um. You know, the Patreon, we got our speakeasy up there every yep. Sunday. We're going to be releasing an episode. And, um, you know, it's 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 just uh, another thing for, for audience to grow and uh, more content we're putting out. So if you're not on Patreon, you can sign up for a, a dollar a month and you can get these videos. I mean, you know, you probably got streaming services, Billy, you're paying 10 bucks for you never watch. Right. Yep. Get rid of that and and. A dollar a month, you could watch these videos or get a couple more if you could. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the speakeasies are doing pretty good. And uh, the people uh, like them. The, our patrons like them. And we're getting good uh, feedback from them, buddy. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. And and it's, you know, just something. It's a little bit different. You know, it's a little bit different than the regular show. Um, there, we typically don't have, uh, you know, a, a set agenda to talk about. We just kind of talk about whatever's going on. You know, may have one or two things that we we talk about, but uh, before yeah, the a topic, and and it's a lot of stuff that Billy we will talk about on the pay behind the paywall that we won't say right on the channel. So you're getting some some premium intel. Yep, really good stuff, and it, it's you know it's it's worth it, Billy. A dollar a month. I mean, you can't you know what, what are you going to get for a dollar a month? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then the other thing is, Bill, you know, we're as we grow. We're going to get more, we want to get more sponsors. So if you you have right. a small business and uh, you know somebody that has a small business, uh, tell them that we offer a lot of exposure. We don't charge people a lot. Um, and, and you get, you know, we're on almost 30 applications, you know, we're on YouTube and, and Spotify, Apple, Amazon. And then we put a logo on our website. Right. Uh, 
you know, I put it on all social media. Yeah. Yep. It's, you get a lot of exposure for a very good price. And, and, you know, we're getting good feedback from our sponsors that they're getting a lot of traffic coming into their businesses. Yeah. Or podcasts. So, you know, and, and it's not just local to, to any PA if, you know, because we have a national international audience. So, you know, if you got a, a business and it's not in Northeast PA, uh, reach out to us. You know, we might be able to help you. Yep. You know, and then the last thing, Billy, before we get into our topic, I want to talk about uh, a restaurant that we ne- we mentioned before on this podcast. Uh, Primavera Pizza is closing. And my buddy uh, Vinny, who owns it, you know, he's retired. And it's 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 sad, Billy. But, I mean, I, I hope he does well in his retirement. And he earned it. Yeah. You know, blame him, you know. But, you know. Uh, it's going to be missed because that's yeah. a heck of a place, Billy. And it was, the food was tremendous. Yeah. There's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of restaurants that are still feeling the effects from 9-11, uh, 9-11 from, uh, from COVID. 9-11. Yeah, but Billy, I don't think, I don't think that was anything to do with why he's, he just wants to retire. He's been in the business a long time. Yeah. And his business was doing fantastic. In fact, it's so busy now because everybody wants to get there before he closes. Yeah. He had to shut the phone lines down. He put down on Facebook that he, they said the phone lines are down. He says, you can't, if you want to order a takeout, you got to come in in person. Yeah. And reservations were through the roof. I mean, his, his business was fantastic. I mean, yeah. so he just, you know, he put his time in and it's time to retire, spend time with the family. So I don't blame him, Yeah, but it's going to be missed because it's a heck of a restaurant and the food, the best Italian food around here, Billy, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. All right. All right, Sean, let's get into our topic this week. Well, let's get right into it, Billy. We are going to be doing an episode on basically the Piston Mafia, which is Piston is like 15 minutes from where we are now. Right. It's going to be on this book, Billy. You can see that. The Life We Chose, uh, William Big Billy D'Elia, who was a alleged boss of the Buffalino crime family, took over after Russell Buffalino. And it's written by uh, Matt Burbeck. Um, and the thing is, Billy, we're going to be doing a Patreon episode. So this will come out on a Friday. And there's going to be a speakeasy episode on Sunday where we're going to talk a little bit more about stuff that, that we didn't want to say on, on this episode. We're going to say behind the paywall. But even on that, we're, there's right. certain things we're not going to talk about, Billy. Because, like I said, there's, we're only 15 minutes away from, from the epicenter where this happened. Right. And it's a whole story in a book. And and to be honest with you, I, full disclosure here, Billy, I know people that were mentioned in the book very well. And I'm not going to talk about those people, even though some of them have given me some information. Some I could say, some I can't. Some I'll say on the Patreon. Right. And other people that are mentioned in the book, I know people very well that know those people. So we're not going to talk about that either. So there's certain things we're going to we're not going to talk about, certain people we're not going to talk about. But Billy, there's enough in this book uh, to 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 really get it a, a juicy episode here, buddy. So yeah, so let's get into it, Billy. Um, overall, the book is very good. It's a very good book. And I talked to you before about this. You know, these, these guys are masters of avoiding self-incrimination. So sure. there's nothing in the book that Billy's going to say that you know he did. He's not going to admit to doing you know any violence or anything like that. So right. you have to take that into consideration. Um, but the thing I love about the book is, you know, Billy graduated in 1964 from Piston High School. Okay. So he wasn't a made guy until the mid seventies, 1975, somewhere around there, which is the same year that Sammy Gravano was made around that time. Uh, Michael yeah. Francis. And the problem I have with those guys is they, they put themselves in the situations that happened before, um, they were made. You know, like the Kennedy stuff in Marilyn Monroe and the assassination of JFK. And and they wouldn't have anything. They wouldn't have knowledge of stuff that happened in the late 50s and the early 60s and stuff. And right. Billy doesn't touch on any of this stuff in the book. You know, he mentioned the Kennedys here and there, but he doesn't get into anything. Like he doesn't say he, he knew about Marilyn Monroe and she was assassinated and JFK. He didn't talk about, you know, knowing anything about the JFK assassination. He doesn't even mention that. So to me, that lends credibility to the book, Billy, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, what, uh, at least what I've ob- observed with the, you know, particularly the Sammy, the bull podcast, when he talks right. about things, he, he, he's very careful not to 
incriminate unless it's something he's already done time for and you know he's already sure. admitted to but he will not absolutely will not put himself in any situation that you know right that he hasn't already the thing about them and you know him and some of the other ones that they they try to go back to time before they were made like if they're made in the 70s billy right that could be all about the kennedy assassination yeah yeah so don't even bring that up like why you're just looking for clickbait you right know? And that to me loses they lose credibility Billy doesn't do this in this book. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I've talked to people, Billy, that said, you know, this book is, is everything he's saying in his book, you know, you can fact check it, you know, it's, it's a real deal, you know, and, and I think that lends credibility and two, two of the names that you're going to hear a lot tonight is going to be Russell Buffalino and Frankie, the Irishman Sheeran. And the thing is, we talked about Buffalino's power, Billy. The power this man had was unbelievable. And Billy says that he was above the commission. Now, I don't I don't know if I agree with that, but the commission had such respect for him that they wouldn't do a lot of things unless Buffalino approved. You know, and the other thing is Frankie the Irishman Sheeran, Billy, the way he's portrayed in his book is he was so feared by other gangsters and other mafia figures because he was a soldier, Billy. Remember, he was a soldier in World War II. Right. And he said that he had that that look to him, that haunted look, like he was always on alert, like a soldier, you know, and he killing to him meant nothing. And a lot of these gangsters, Bill, because we talk about best friend killing a best friend, it, it, a lot of them do have a conscience that it wears on them when they, they have to murder their order to mur murder their best friend. But the Frankie Sheeran is just it was just business. And he was just, you know, he was like a machine. He was like a killing machine. And the other thing, Billy, is is we talk all the time about you know, I, when you're doing anything on history, whether it's JFK, the mafia, anything has to be fluid. So new information comes in, you have to present it. And if you were wrong about something, you have to admit it. So when we get into the Jimmy Hoffa stuff, I'm going to admit, I'm going to admit that I changed my mind, Billy, on something that okay. I think I was wrong about. Yeah. So we're going to get into that. Okay. You know, so let's talk about big Billy Dialia. Now, the interesting thing about him, Bill, and again, this is told by Matt Burbeck, you know, so Billy told him his story and, and Burbeck wrote it. And I've seen some interviews uh, with Burbeck um, and we'll try to get him on, Billy. We'll try to get him on. OK. Uh, but the interesting thing about Billy is he was half Italian, half Irish, and he was 100 percent Italian on his dad's side. And he was 100 percent Irish on his mom's side. Now, this is the thing I told people, and this is a myth. Billy, that you have to be 100% Italian to be a made guy. Right. Said there was some time, and I thought it was the 80s, but it was actually earlier. It was in the 70s that because of the dwindling talent pool, basically to pull from, the the commission changed that, that you you have to be now 100% Italian on your dad's side. Okay. And it doesn't matter what your mother's side is. Right. right. As long as you're 100% on your dad's side. And that's the thing with Billy. And a lot of the things I noticed, though, Billy, are the guys that got made that are only 50%, right? The other half is they're, they're always Irish or Jewish. And that goes into what we talk about, that you can't talk about American Cosa Nostra unless you talk about the relationship with the Irish gangster and the Jewish gangster. Right, because sure. The whole history of organized crime in the United States has to be told through those three ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. There's no other way to tell it, Billy. So the book opens up with a quote from Russell Buffalino, and it says, uh, the impossible we could fix right away, but the miracles take about a day or two. And this is the power that, that Russ had in, in you know, he talks about growing up in Pittston. He talks about how, you know, Pittston was like a, a coal, coal mining town. And he talked about, you know, being Catholic, and there was a lot of discrimination against Catholics. And we know that the history of the United States sure. is a lot of discrimination against right, right, Irish, particularly oh, Irish, yeah, Catholic. particularly Irish, but not yep. just Irish, but the Italian and Polish yep. against yep. too. Yep. Um, and he talks about that in the book, you know, and he talks about his relationship with his father. His father was a, a plumber. He was a working man. He had nothing to do with organized crime, but Billy had a strong, he had a rocky relationship, really strained relationship with his father. They they didn't agree on a lot of things, and and. He talks about how, you know, Russ Buffalino would basically become his father figure. And Russ would call him a son. And he would, you know, he would take on that role because, you know, Billy didn't have a particularly close relationship with his dad. 
And when he was in, in high school, Bill, he didn't get in a lot of trouble. He did a little gambling, but, you know, just like office pool type stuff, like nothing, right. nothing major. And, you know, sports gambling was really big. And he was in the normal things a teenager would be, you know, chasing girls and sports and, you know, organized crime wasn't on his, you know, list of, of things he wanted to accomplish. Right. Sure. But, but what happened was he met a guy by the name of Davis Stico. And David Stico's son would end up dating Billy Dahlia's um, sister and end up marrying her. And David Stico was uh, the underboss for Russell Buffalino. So this is how he met Buffalino, right? It was true, true of Stico. And he introduced him formally. He seen him because everybody in the area knew who Buffalino was. Of course. Of course. And, and you know, what Estico did is, um, you know, he was like the right hand for for Buffalino, and he became close with Billy, and he introduces Billy to to Russ, and and he, you know, Russ said to him, he said, "Don't let my goomba here ruin you," you know, because Estico had a bad temper. Estico was a he was a pretty intense guy, and and the thing is, when you talk about Buffalino, how powerful he was, but you also got to see the guys around him. Like he he starts to to put people around him, like Big Billy, six foot four. Uh, uh, Frankie Sheeran's like six five. Estico is like a, a bigger guy, intimidating guys, and the, these guys are you know around him. So when he walks into a place, everybody knows who he is already. But then he's surrounded by these guys who are you're very intimidating. Right. You know, he had this mystique about him. You know, and and the book gets into a lot of stories, Bill, and it gets into a lot of how Russell Buffalino became power because a lot of it is through marriage. So he ends up marrying into the Scandra family. His his wife was uh, cousins with them. And this is how Russ got into the, to the Buffalo, the, what would be the Buffalino crime family, but the Northeast PA mob. Right. Um, you know, he, he becomes boss and he becomes the thing about Russ is he had connections to almost every single mafia boss, the 26 families across the country, Billy, he would have a personal connection to almost every single boss. You know, and that's the thing that made Russ so powerful. And we're going to talk about that. And even Billy, he had a connection to Winter Hill up in Boston. And some things that I heard on the street from people I know in Boston, I'm not going to talk about that now, but I will talk about that on the on the Patreon speakeasy. Yeah. Make sure you sign up for that because this is really good. And the other thing, Bill, I forgot to mention is this book is on our bookshop. Yeah. Get this book because it's definitely worth the read. It's It's definitely... A really good read. So he talks about all that. He talks a lot about corruption in Scranton, Scranton, Pennsylvania, which we know about, Billy. We live oh, here. come on. In Scranton? <laughs> uh, I, I know. It's that. a shock, isn't it? It's a shock. <laughs> but, um, you know, and he talks a lot about how how Russ had connections with, you know, Kansas City, the Cosa Nostra family in Kansas City run by a guy named, named Nick Zavella. In the importance of Kansas City, Billy, and you probably remember this from the movie Casino, is Kansas City was the last, it was kind of like a way station, Billy. So the Northeast families, right? last stop, instead of going all the way to Vegas, would be Kansas City. Right. And meet in that, that supermarket that was owned by the underboss, DeLuna, out there. Yeah. And, um, you know, the uh, suitcases of money would be going back and forth. Right. That was like the... Like that. And so Kansas City was a very important connection to the outfit in Chicago and to the commission. Yeah. So by Russ having such a connection to Kansas City, it's very important. And he also had connection to like Milwaukee. And that would have been Frank Ballastari, who was a very powerful mob boss that people probably you probably never even heard that name, but he's oh. a very powerful guy. And Milwaukee was like they were like the Jersey mob in the, they were like the Sopranos to the commission. Gotcha. Like, but Compared Milwaukee to, that to, to the outfit in Chicago. Oh, to Chicago. Okay. Yeah, because they would do they would do work because Chicago basically runs everything west of the Mississippi. So they would run, they would do a lot of the dirty work for Chicago, you know, and they were very close. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, Russ had these connections at Pittsburgh. Another name that's prominent in the book is Kelly Manorino uh, in, in La Rocca. They were, they were uh, big time players in the Pittsburgh Posen Oster family. And, and you see what Russ has, all these connections to these bosses. So this makes him valuable, Billy. Because in a valuable to the commission, because now the commission sees all these bosses trust Russ Buffalino. So if we have a problem, like say, you know, Jersey and Rhode Island families are feuding, right? Like 
you mentioned that in the Sopranos. Remember, we we took it to that Rhode Island crew. Remember, Tony says that. Right. Well, if they have a problem, they could send in Russ Buffalino because he's got a, such a valuable relationship with both bosses. So the commission don't have headaches. They don't have to start whacking people and bring attention to themselves. They could bring in Buffalino and he could, he could, everybody's got respect for him. So he'll end that problem. And that's where he yeah. got his, you know, a lot of his power from Billy. Yeah. Sean, let me ask you a question. Sure. At the height of the Buffalino crime family, which was probably what seventies, early eighties. I would say probably, yeah, we were going into probably the height would probably be the late 70s. Late 70s. Yeah. How many guys were in that crew? Yeah, that's interesting, Billy. They're from FBI reports, um, they they said between like 50 and 100. Okay. I, I think Billy mentioned in the book there was about maybe maybe 200. Uh, but the thing is there was, there was only about 25 guys in North, Northeast PA that were made. Because that's right. another thing, Russ. Russ was spread out. He wasn't just in Pittston and Scranton. Yeah, he had crews in in Buffalo, in Rochester, New York, upstate New York, and he had crews down in Florida. So he was spread out pretty good. So he might have had only maybe a hundred guys compared to the commission, who might have ten thousand. Right. Sure. You know? But but they were spread out, and the thing is, he had that relationship, even though it was a small family. He had a relationship with every boss across the country, and that made him valuable to the commission. And this is why the commission respected him so much. And they anything that would affect the, the mafia on a national level, they would really ask, the commission would have that go through Russ Buffalino. They would want his opinion on that. Okay. You know, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Yeah, okay. About the stuff that happened. But you're going to like this story, Billy. One, there's actually two good stories here. One of them was about... Uh, Yankee Joe Pepitone. Sure. So Joe Pepitone was a big star and he was a friend of Buffalino. And and Buffalino invited him to there's a wedding and uh Pepitone is there and Pepitone has a bodyguard with him. Okay. And the bodyguard was making a couple comments that you know wasn't really you know, disparaging to some of the women there. And there were daughters of of made guys and stuff, and it wasn't oh very very problematic. <laughs> Let's put yeah. it that way. Yeah. So Dave Estico, who I mentioned earlier, hears about these comments. He hears them over overhears Pepitone, or not Pepitone, but his bodyguard saying this. So he picks up a chair and 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 beats the one bodyguard, just hammers them to nothing. Oh, and then when he's introduced to Pepitone. The Stico says, Joe, you're a great Yankee, you're a great ball player, but he says, you got to get new bodyguards. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is the connections Russ had. He had a lot of Hollywood people that that celebrities and ball players. And we'll go through some of the pictures in the books later in the book because he's got pictures with Bob Hope. And, you know, there's a picture of Billy with Michael Jackson. I mean, there's, you know, they had powerful friends. And, and yeah. another great story, Billy, is, and we'll keep it clean. We'll keep it clean because this is the, the not the pay channel, it's the family channel, and you know. But um, it was Frank Sinatra's story, and he talked about uh, Jilly Russo was um, Frank Sinatra's main guy, and he was the guy Billy that broke up the fight between Mario Puzo, right, right, right. When, when Sinatra went after him because of the well, I, yeah, I mean there wasn't much of a fight. I mean, no, Puzo but he a... got between them. But Jilly, right. Jilly was real close to Sinatra. Yeah, of course. And he had a restaurant up in New York. Yeah. So what happened was one night. Uh, Billy, Billy D'Elia, Frankie Sheeran, and Russ Buffalino go up to the restaurant and they come in and they, they say, uh, uh, you know, they sit at the table and Jilly comes over and he, you know, he's talking to everybody and he says, uh, Jilly says to Russ, he says, you know, Fra uh, Frank is in town and uh, Russ is like, oh, I didn't know that. Tell him, tell him I said hello. And he says, uh, Jilly says, well, you don't understand Russ. He's coming here tonight. And Russ said, okay, I'll see him when he comes in then. And Jilly's like, you don't understand. You're sitting at Frank's table. So all of a sudden, everything oh. went quiet. And Russ, for about a half a minute, didn't say anything. He's just staring daggers at Jilly. Yeah. And, and finally, he says to him, he says, you tell Sinatra, uh, when he comes in, he could sit at my effing table. Oh. And he said, if he doesn't want to, then he can <laughs> laugh himself. And you tell oh. him that. 
<laughs> so Dilly's all nervous and he comes in and guess what happened when Sinatra came in? He sat at Russ's table. <laughs> and he didn't didn't make a beef about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that's the power he had, Billy. You know, and and you know, he talked a lot about um he talked about Appalachian, their the meeting, because Russ was there. Wow. And, you know. And when and that, did that happen? When was that? That was 57, I believe. 50, okay. That was after the, the Anastasia hit, though. Anastasia, yeah. Yeah, and that's where, you know, G Vito Genovese and, and uh, the, the commission wanted to, you know, uh, just assure everybody that there's not going to be an all-out war. Right. Anastasia was a problem that had to go, basically. And, and you know, they wanted But the problem is they had all these guys from all over the country, these mob bosses. Right. And, get the mile at this Joe Babara's house up in upstate New York. And this is the problem. The state police seen all these cars coming in and he knew something was up. Sure. You know, and, and then there's a couple other stories, Billy. There's a, there's a good story about a, a test that um, Russ did for big Billy, because it, as you know, more and more, as time goes on more and more, he starts to trust uh, Billy, big Billy a lot. And like I said, he starts to call him his son and he starts to introduce him as his son to people, or he's like a son to me, you know? And, and right. one story was, it was a Thanksgiving and they were up in Buffalo. Okay. Now they drove from, from Pittston to Buffalo. And you know, that's not a, that's not down the street, Billy. That's a long no, drive. It's a long drive. Right. And they go and they, they stayed at this hotel and uh, then they drive back and it's Thanksgiving day now. Okay. And big Billy's getting ready to sit with his family, his mom and his, his, I believe he's married at the time and everybody they're getting ready for Thanksgiving dinner. And Russ calls him and he says, I need you to do me a big favor. I left my razor in Buffalo at this the hotel we stayed at and I need it. I need it now. And he's like, Russ, it's Thanksgiving. He's like, no, I need it now. So big Billy drove from Pittston oh. back to Buffalo wow. back on Thanksgiving. And he met Russ at the, the social club they hung out. And, and when he walked in, Russ was sitting there with a lot of the other guys. And when he puts the razor down, Russ says, see, I told you he was going to do it because it was a loyalty. Wow. Yeah. Oh, you know? and, and after he did that, though, he understood that, you know, this is a guy I could trust. Right. This, it's going to do anything I ask him to do. It's not going to yeah. question it, no matter what it is. Because they always tell you, Bill, when you become a made guy, you know, this family comes before your own family. Right. And then the next thing he talked about is when he became a made guy, Billy. And it was an interesting story um, because Billy always felt that because he was half Irish, he couldn't be made. So he didn't even know about the changes because again, that happens at the commission level. Yeah. Right. right? So he said that at his ceremony, it didn't, it didn't happen like it did in Hollywood. There was no gun on the table. There was right. no picking at a trigger finger and right. blood blood oath or a burning of a saint right right here's what happened he was called to a restaurant okay and russ was there and he took him in the back and at when they opened up the door there's a huge table there and there was bosses from all over the country kansas city milwaukee chicago there was representatives from the commission wow we're all there and uh russ sits billy down right by him he puts his arm around him and he says you all know Billy, you know he's my son, and now he's one of us. Huh. And that was it. And then everybody at the table got up and congratulated wow. him, kissed him yeah. on the cheek, you know, the old Sicilian mock. Sure, kid. sure. And they went around and everybody congratulated him, and Billy became a made guy. Wow. That's how he became. And that was just the thing. Like, in and in a lot of he passed over a lot of people now later on when Billy when Russ would make him acting boss. Mm-hmm. You know, but but everybody understood that this is his his guy. Right. You know, and he's like a son to him, and now he's a made guy. Yeah. So now he starts moving up. Now I forget, Sean. Did you mention did D. Elliot, did he have kids? Or I mean, I'm sorry, Buffalino. Did no, he Buffalino never had any kids, Billy? Okay. He, he um him and his wife didn't have kids, and and this is why, you know, he took Billy under his wing and and became a son to him. Gotcha. He okay. really became his son in right. all sense and purposes. You know, it's right, kind of right. like me with Nathan. Like it's sure. like, you know, just he's like a son. They do everything together. Yeah. You know, and and 
Billy treated him or Russ treated him like a son. And you could see interviews, Billy, uh, with Big Billy. Right. And you see him talk. And even Burbeck in the interview, I seen him. He says, even to this day, uh, Big Billy loves Russ Buffalino. Like you can't, if you say anything negative about him, you're gonna get a fight from from Big Billy because he's gonna right. he's gonna defend him and he's gonna and he always says he says, you know, he they somebody asked him a question. They asked him, well, what did what did Russ pay you? And he says he didn't pay me because remember the mob is different. The employer don't pay the employees. Right. The employees pay the employer. Pay the employer right. The money goes up to the top. Right. But he says what he did is he he taught me how to make money. He taught me how to run these rackets and how to do this, how to run an operation, how to treat people, uh, you know, and, and this is what he, he, he taught him. And he became, you know, he became his main guy. So now he's a main, he's a made guy and he gets into, um, well, the making of the movie, the Godfather, Billy. And, you know, basically a lot of the stuff in the book was in the, the series, the offer that we talked about. Oh, okay. Making it got for a lot of that. But the thing is, Russ Buffalino was left out. A lot of the things that Joe Colombo was doing, Russ Buffalino was right there by his side. Hmm. And even Marlon Brando, remember I told us when we did the episode on the offer, I told a story where Brando was uh, drunk and they had like the extras in that, that scene where they're all in the backyard. Right. And, and Brando moons. Right. And it was happened to be Buffalino's family. And they said, Oh my God, I'm sorry. I couldn't. But <laughs> the thing is, according to the book, uh, Buffalino became a mentor to Marlon Brando. Interesting. Yes. And he basically taught him how to act and how to be a mob boss. So this is why you get that, you know, a lot of mob bosses aren't, aren't like Vito Corleone was in there, but right. that was how Russ wanted him portrayed. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. He, they wow. had a lot to do, Billy. A lot to do. Uh, Buffalino and Colombo were the two guys, the two main guys that had a lot to do with that movie. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting that he's left out. You know, in the offer, they don't even mention Buffalino. Right. Well, they probably didn't want to. Maybe they didn't know. Many names Maybe they didn't know about it. It's possible, but they probably didn't. You know, like Holly, I mean, Hollywood does that all the time. They don't, they don't want to confuse the audience. So they consolidate sure. five different people into one or whatever. This is true. Yeah. This is true. DK's Corner, located on 802 East Lackawanna Avenue in Oliphant, Pennsylvania. Visit DK's Corner for hot and cold sandwiches, soups, salads, pizza, and delicious breakfast, including breakfast sandwiches, specialty coffees, and DK's Razzle Dazzle Flavor Shaken Espressos. And take it from me, the best cheese steaks around. Follow DK's Corner on Facebook and Instagram, or call them at 570 209 0278 to find out about their daily specials and catering. Check out DK's Corner, Oliphant's Little Hoagie Shop. And we thank DK's Corner for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. That's DK's Corner in Oliphant, Pennsylvania. Are you thinking about selling your house? Well, Bob Connors, a realtor at Christian Saunders Real Estate, says, I can't sell your house, but I sure as heck can market it and get it from sell to sold. Call Bob today for great marketing and to get a ton of eyeballs on your house. Are you in the market to buy a home? Not sure where to start. If it looks like something you shouldn't buy, Bob's going to tell you that. Think you can't buy a house or have no idea where to start? Been there, done that. Bob will get you going in the right direction. You can reach Bob at 570-614-3624 or 570-335-9000. And you can find Bob on Facebook at Bob Connors Realtor. Whether you call Bob or not, please remember stay awesome, all you awesome humans, and be kind to each other. Bob Connors, the realest real estater. And thanks to Bob Connors and Christian Saunders Real Estate for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. So, next we get into the Hoffa situation. So, we talked a lot about that. We did an episode on Hoffa. And, Billy, this is where I'm going to admit that I think I was wrong about something. Because I've always thought that, you know, Frankie Sheeran made up a lot of stuff. There's no doubt he, he put himself, again, he puts himself in with the Kennedy assassination and the hits right. on Castro and all this stuff. That never happened. But the thing is, I always felt that how do you get Jimmy Hoffa from that restaurant to the place where they killed him without Frank Sheeran? I don't, and, and maybe, they, I still think maybe 
they had him. Maybe they told him that um, the, they were just going to have a meeting, and he gets Russ. He gets Hoffa from that restaurant to the house. But I no longer think that Frankie Sheeran was in on the planning of killing Jimmy Hoffa. I don't think he killed. I know. I don't think he pulled the trigger, and I don't think he killed him. And it's because of his book. You know, that's really swayed me to say, you know what? Because I believe a lot of the stuff in the book. So I got to take what Billy's saying in his book, you know, as as the truth. Right. So set, we'll set it up. We we know the problems, basically the problems Hoffa was having. He was having problems with Tony Pro Provenzano, who was a, a Genovese captain, and they got in a big fight in prison. He was having problems with Fat Tony Salerno. And Tony Salerno, you know, he, he basically, they said he was the boss, but now the information came out. He was more of a front boss. Uh, Chin Giganti was actually the boss of Genovese, but Salerno was very powerful, very powerful, wealthy, you know, higher up in the, in the Genovese family. And they were having major problems with Hoffa. And Frank Fitzsimmons has taken over the Teamster Union when Hoffa went to prison. And they were very happy. The mob was very happy with Fitzsimmons because they could say, Hoffa would say no to them on certain things, on loans and stuff. Fitzsimmons wouldn't. Right. Because you guys want to dip into the pension fund and borrow money and don't worry about paying a loan back and this and that. So they were very, very happy with Fitzsimmons. So Hoffa wanted back in that union. And, you know, the book talks about how, you know, Russ really loved Jimmy Hoffa. They were really close. And he kept telling Jimmy, like, you got to back off. He said, you know, why don't you just take a position in like one of the, the like Delaware or something like that. You don't have to be the boss, you know, but Hoffa, like in the movie, Bill, he said, it's my union. And he says, I want my union. Back. Yeah. It, it got to the point where, you know, everybody understood that, that Hoffa wasn't backing down. He wanted that union and he was going to take Fitzsimmons out if he had to. And then Russ sent Frankie Sheeran to talk to him and to tell Jimmy Hoffa, because Sheeran was real close with him, and tell him, you got to back off. But Jimmy wasn't backing off. So mm. what happened is they have that wedding, just like, you know, it was uh, in the movie. Right. And, and Frankie Sheeran drives Russ Buffalino to Detroit, and they go to his meeting, and then Hoffa disappears. But here's the story in the book that changes everything for me. A couple of days after that, um, Billy Dahlia said that Russ was uh, asked them to pick him up and they're driving to upstate New York. Okay. And they're going to a meeting and he didn't tell them where they're going. He just said drive. So they go north and they're driving. And then he said, when he gets to the restaurant, he says, right, right when they're almost there, uh, Russ says to him, he says, okay, we're going to be meeting uh, the two Tonys, meaning Tony Salerno, fat Tony Salerno, and Tony Pro Provenzano, and Frankie Sheeran's going to be there. And the two Tonys are worried. They're scared to death that Frankie Sheeran's going to try to kill him for what happened to Jimmy. And at this point, Big Billy realizes that the two Tonys were behind the Hoffa hit. But he also realizes that they would have never did that without Russ Buffalino giving the okay. So, you know, Frankie Sheeran is really upset. So he gets to the restaurant and Russ takes him by the arm and he says, listen, don't be stupid. Just say, tell these guys, you're not going to bother them. You're not going to go after them and leave it at that. And everything's going to be all right. And you can see Sheeran was upset, but he said, okay. And then they sit down at the table and he tells them, he's, you know, he says, you're not going to have any problem from me. And the two Tonys are relieved. Now think about this, Billy. Here you have a guy, Frankie Sheeran, not a made guy, but he's two of the most powerful uh, gangsters in the Genovese family are scared to death that this guy's going to kill right. him. So it tells you everything about Frankie yeah. Sheeran. Yeah, right. How vicious this guy was and how, you know, just he was a soldier, Billy. And they, they, a lot of them were afraid of him. I mean, let's put it that way. I mean, but it changes the whole narrative. Because if Frank, you know, Frankie Sheeran shot him, what you know, why would he be upset at the two Tonys like that? Right, sure, so, yeah, changes everything. But here's what else happened: there was another guy that was there but wasn't at the meeting, and it was Sally Bugs. And Sally Bugs was considered the guy that a lot of people think pulled the trigger on Hoffa. Okay, so when they're leaving, 
it's just Billy and it's uh, Russ and they leave with Frankie Sheeran. And you can see Sheeran's upset. And Russ says, listen, I don't want you to be upset. And Sheeran says something to the effect about, you know, I'm not going to bother the two Tonys. But then he says something about Sally Bugs. And Russ don't say anything. Quiet. And then three days later, Sally Bugs gets shot in the face. Murdered. Wow. Killed. So yeah, you know, Billy didn't say it. He didn't say what, but you could imply from the book, you yeah. know, that Buffalino probably said, hey, listen. You're not going to touch the two Tonys, right? Take your aggravation out of Sally Bugs. He's just a hit. he's just a button man anyway. Yeah, he's not yeah. he's not a boss. He's not a capo. So, you know, and they actually showed that in the movie, The Irishman, Billy, where he walks up. Remember, De Niro walks up and he shoots him right in the face. That was Sally right. Bugs. Oh, and okay. Glasses. Yeah, right, right. You know, so that kind of changes everything for me, Billy. That kind of changes, you know, the the whole thing that you know, and it just shows you how feared Frankie Sheeran was. And he talked about how, you know, when Billy first met Sheeran, he was he was close to him. You know, he was very close to him, uh, but he was leery of him. He was leery of him. There was a story where, you know, Sheeran was with a prostitute and he left the bar and the prostitute just wouldn't stop talking. And Sheeran got all upset. He's told her to shut up and he, she wouldn't. She kept talking. She kept talking. So this other guy came over and tried to be a hero. Right. And, and uh Sheeran knocks him out, knocks the other guy out. And then he puts a couple hundred dollars in the guy's pocket, in his shirt pocket. And he says, here, you take this hooker off my, get, get, you take her. He says, you listen to her, keep gabbing and stuff. And that's how he was. He was crazy. And a lot of people feared him. Yeah. You know? And he'll talk about later how the movie and the book came up, came about was uh, later on, you know, after Sheeran went to prison and Buffalino died, and Russ takes over, he'll talk about the book. And I'll talk about that later, Bill. I'll talk about that at the end, what happened with the, with the book that Sheeran wrote, uh, I Heard You Paint Houses. Right. We'll talk about that at the end. But here's another interesting story, Billy, about Carlo Gambino. Do you have any questions, Billy, before we go on? No, no. Keep going. Hurry. Keep so going. Gambino, what happened was Gambino's nephew, was one of his nephews was trying to get into the garment industry. And he tried to cut in on Russ Buffalino controlled a lot of the garment. It definitely in Northeast PA, you know, parts of New York, he controlled it. And Gambino's nephew tried to cut in on that. And Russ basically told him to back off and, and he wouldn't. So then he told him, if you don't back off, I'm going to send you back to your uncle in a box. Okay. So now, you know, this is Carlo Gambino. He's the head yeah. of the Gambino crime family. Wow. Him. So he's very... Gambino's upset. So he calls Russ to this meeting up in New York. So they go in there and it's Billy D'Elia and it's a couple of guys from the Piston Mob. Interesting. He didn't ask Frankie Shear in there. And the reason why is Russ didn't want to escalate it anymore. To have Shear in there, they would know, you know, they would see more of a threat and they wouldn't, he didn't want to escalate it. So he didn't have Shear in at this meeting. But they meet Carlo Gambino and who's there but Neely Della Croach. And we talked about Della Croce. He was the underboss. Right. Um, he should have been the boss. Should have been the boss. When Castellano takes over. But right. he's at the meeting. And I think Castellano's at the meeting, too. And Carlos really mad. He's aggravated. And he gets right after Russ. And he's like, you know, what are you doing threatening my nephew? He says, what if I send you back in a box? And now everybody gets tense. Yeah. What he says that. And... Billy's Billy's there and he's big Billy's starting to get a little nervous that something might happen because they're at the sit down here and Neely Della Croce is the the voice of reason he steps in and he says whoa 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 mm -hmm. Carlo, you can't talk to Russ like that yeah he says something to the effect he said Russ uh, Carlo starts going off you know I'm sick of this I'm sick of it and then Neil's like Carlo, we'll have to kill everybody are you kidding me he says we got to stop this nonsense yeah, right? yeah. And what and Billy got nervous at first because when he said he we got to kill everybody, he thought he meant everybody that's at that meeting. But what he thought about later is what he really meant, what Della Croce really meant by that is we'd have to kill bosses from all over the country. Right. If he did anything to Buffalino. Right. He was so bosses, respected. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. even the other families right. the commission would be upset. Yes. Yeah. That's what he said. So anyway, what happened at that meeting was they, they brokered the peace, largely through Della Croce. 
And and Della Croce had a really good relationship with Buffalino. They were really close. And, you know, he brokered the peace there, everything. But guess what? Buffalino got his way because Gambino's nephew never cut into his garment industry. He he went elsewhere. <laughs> so Russ ended up winning the argument against Carlo yeah. Gambino. That's pretty important, Billy. Yeah. Because Gambino was, you know, he's sitting on the commission. Sure. He's a powerful, powerful guy. But it's arguably sure the most right important the most powerful right boss in, in the country yeah right and it shows you how powerful buffalino is that that della croce would put himself in in kind of the, the middle there right you know so that was really important um and let's see so then it, it talks about how you know later on russ would even be asked to by the commission and be asked to take over the genovese family and he would be like an acting boss for the gen when they were having trouble. They had a little bit of a, a small war there. And Russ took over the family. That's how respected he was. And they actually had the same thing in Buffalo, Billy, when Buffalo had some problems because they had a boss there, Magadino, who I think was related to Buffalo. You know, he was a boss for a long time. But after that, they had a little issue there. Who's going to be the boss? And Russ took over that family. So that's how powerful he was, Bill, where he would be an acting boss. Of certain families, you know. Wow. So what happens is um later on, um Russ uh, Russ gets into a problem with this guy Napoli. And and Billy says that the, the government set him up and he makes these threats against Napoli and he ends up going to prison. And when he does, he asks Big Billy to take over as acting boss. And everybody understands that Billy is the guy now. And now he he really passed over a lot of guys that's been in the Piston mob and been with Russ a lot longer, you know. So there was a lot of hard feelings there, but nobody questioned the the order. Yeah, he was in charge, and that's that, you know. And and what happens is uh, Billy gets a, a lot of respect, and he starts to become what what Russ kind of was, like a, a mediator to different uh, gangs and and different families all across the country where he had that respect, not to the sense that Buffalino did. Right. Like nobody did, you know, right. and it's interesting. They talked about Angelo Bruno in Philly. Okay. Angelo Bruno, Bruno was the boss of Philly and he was real close with Buffalino. They called him the gentle Don. Okay. Because he would try to not use violence unless it was absolutely 100% necessary. So what happens is these guys in Philly take, take them out. And that's what started the whole chain of effects of, uh, you know, Nicky Scarfo and John Stanford and all the, the wars, the Philly wars that would go Philly, on. Yeah. You know, and Russ was in prison when this happened. And he was very upset, very upset that Bruno was taken out. And, you know, he made that clear to Billy. And Billy doesn't go into details in the book, but we know what happened. Um, all of them guys that were involved in taking Bruno out, they end up getting whacked, all of them. So that came from the commission, but if you put two and two together, probably Buffalino was probably the most upset that Angel Bruno was taken out because he was he was his closest friend, even closer than any of the guys in the commission were to Bruno, you know? Yeah. And, you know, Billy, and that would cement Billy's uh, relationship with Philly, though, because he would become friends with guys, you know, and, and Nicky Scarfo and and John Stanford, and even Skinny Joey Molino, and the, you know about the, the Stanford Wars with Merlino, they would get into in the 90s. Well, you know, Stanford would actually ask Big Billy to take over the Philly family later on. And Billy said he didn't want to because he was friends with the Merlino faction and, and Ralph Natelli and all these other guys on the other side. And he was also friends with Stanford. So he said, I don't want, you know, I'll step in and I'll, kind of broker piece, you know, like, like that's what he became kind of like what Buffalino was because he was very respected Billy. And, um, you know, and then the book talks about when, when Russ dies, you know, in 94 and then, you know, by, by this time, Billy's cemented as the official boss now, you know, so he takes over as the boss of uh, the pits, the mob. And, and, you know, he becomes one of the last really, respected bosses bill you know he becomes one of the last of the last right yeah you know and and but 
you know, that's basically it. I mean, there's a lot of, there's other stories in the book. Uh, there's stuff I do want to leave. Um, I want to leave for the, the Patreon. There's stuff I want to talk about. Oh, he did, he did mention um, the Castellano hit when, when Gotti takes out Castellano and the Chico and them guys. Um, he said that Russ, Russ was in prison at the time. And Billy said he offered really no opinion on that. He didn't say anything because he didn't really like Castellano. Like a lot of them didn't. Right. You know, Castellano was really greedy. Yeah. And, and they didn't like him. They they felt like a lot of people felt that he just got where he was because, uh, uh, you know, he was calling Ambino's um, brother-in-law. Sure. So, you know, he didn't offer opinion on that. But you have to wonder, Billy, if if Gotti or DeChico or any of those guys ever reached out to Buffalino. Now, it's not mentioned in the book, but it's just something that I'm going to speculate on because, um, remember, Neely Della Croce was very close with Buffalino, and Neely Della Croce was a mentor for John Gotti. So if Gotti respected Della Croce, you got to figure he respected Buffalino. Right. So they may have reached out to to, to Buffalino and told him, you know, this was going to happen, and that's why, you know, Russ offered no opinion on it. That's Enough Out of You is also sponsored by Case Quattro Winery, featuring over 20 flavors of wine from dry red, dry white, and fruit for your sampling pleasure. Case Quattro Winery offers entertainment, parties, and private events. Now serving a full menu with a little something for everyone, including appetizers, salads, dinners, pizza, and desserts. Case Quattro has some of the best live entertainment in the area with comedy and karaoke nights and live bands. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram for all of our upcoming events. And if you mention the code OUTTA, that's O-U-T-T-A, you get 15% off of your order. Located on Main Street in Peckville, Pennsylvania, call 570-382-3855 for more information. And we thank Case Quattro Winery for their support. And we would like to thank our sponsor, Gracious Day Grains. Uh, Sean, you like to eat healthy, don't you? Always, buddy. I try to eat healthy as much as I can. Yeah. And there is nothing healthier than uh, what they call like farm to table, right? This, so when you when you can get something right from the ground and, and make it and then put it right on your table. Um, and Gracious Day Grains, they have a tremendous selection and it's totally organic everything is you know they don't use any sort of herbicides or pesticides or anything like that they have um, a bunch of different uh different products on their website gracious day grain so if you go to graciousdaymilling.com uh you you'll find a, a bunch of great stuff there sean yeah you will billy and, and it's owned by tom maxey who's a who's a great guy from virginia um he's a truth seeker just like uh me and you buddy and uh, Tom's growing philosophy follows the wisdom of farmers of centuries past. And a quote from Tom is, if we practice the right rotations, we exclude the bugs and weeds without needing herbicides or pesticides. So, I mean, this is great, Billy. I mean, what he's doing is fantastic. There's cornbread mix, there's cornmeal, popcorn he sells, buckwheat pan. Sean, have you had buckwheat pancakes? Have no, buddy. Oh my, they're delicious. I love buckwheat pancakes. And they, and and Gracious uh, Gracious Day Grain sells buckwheat pancakes. Just go to their website and, and you know, you'll be able to find all of this stuff there. You can order it right off the website. You can find out all about how they how they farm and, and their whole philosophy, Tom's philosophy. It's great stuff. It really is, Billy. And one of the things he does is he grinds small batches at, at very low temperatures, which retains the flavor and the freshness. Of course, and and it, I mean, it can't get any fresher than that. I mean, it's right, literally right from the ground. So again, go to graciousdaymilling.com and just you know take a look on there. You can order whatever you want, and and they'll they'll send it right to your door. I mean, again, it just it doesn't get any doesn't get any fresher than that, right from Tom's farm to your door to your table. So absolutely, and eat healthy, eat healthy, and you'll feel better. Absolutely, I wish I could do that. I wish I could eat healthier, Sean. I'm, We'll start with Tom's stuff, buddy. I, I'm going to. I'm going to order some of those buckwheat pancakes. I love. There making, you go. I'm going to try them too, Billy. Yeah, they're really good. 
All right. Gracious Day. We thank Gracious Day Grains for their sponsorship. Thank you. Hmm. So interesting. Yeah. It was just, it's just really a really good book. And, you know, like I said, it's up on our bookshop. Yeah. Ask everybody, you know, check it out. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, there's stuff in there that you're not going to, it's not going to incriminate. He's not, right. not going to say anything like that. But the one thing that he said, Billy, that was interesting. I seen it on an interview with Burbeck and he said that, did, um, was Russ worried about, or not Russ, but was Big Billy worried about admitting he was a member of the mob? Because he kind of does in this book. And yeah. Burbeck said, we checked with our lawyers and stuff. And there was no, there's nothing that could be done about that. So he wasn't really worried about that. And I'm thinking, well, that's interesting because when you think about it, you're admitting that you're a member of a criminal organization, right? Right. You think that would be involved Rico? I don't know. But apparently he said no. And, you know, nothing's happened to him since. So, hmm. and he's still, and Big Billy's still living in Piston. He's living in Russ's old house. Yeah. And, you know, he's, he's the last, last of the last, Billy. He's respected. <laughs> He's got to be what his late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, he's around yeah. seventy. He's about, I think seventy, seventy-five, something. Well, he graduated uh, Pittston in sixty-four, Billy. So, okay, figure it out, buddy. So, uh, so was it uh, sixty years ago? So that'd make yeah, put him 67, 78, Yeah, yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I just want to see if we could get see if we could see some of these pictures, Billy. You can see that that's that's Russ on the top there, and then. Got a picture here. Here's Jimmy Hoffa with uh, Buffalino's nephew or Buffalino's cousin. That was his lawyer. You see Big Billy with Russ, and you see how big he is. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then you see Russ there laughing. Yeah. Here we go. Here's Fat Tony Salerno. We talked about a lot there with the cigar. Right. And then Jimmy Hoffa. Um, let's see. Oh, here's uh, here's one with Russ with... Uh, James Kahn, though. Sonny Corleone. Oh, yeah. Huh. Wow. Yeah. And on the bottom here, that's Sinatra, Buffalino, and that's a guy by the name of Andy Russo, who was a capo in the Colombo family. Okay. And he was real close with James Kahn. He's actually um, he's the godfather for Scott Kahn, the actor that was in Hawaii Five-0, Jim Kahn. Yeah. Son. yeah. Here's a picture of Big Billy with Russ, and you also see Frank Sheeran there with Russ. That's okay. Sheeran there, you see how big yep. he is too. Yeah. So imagine those guys walking in with Russ. Wow. You know, and here's here's an interesting picture with uh, Big Billy and Michael Jackson because he said he he took over as Michael Jackson's manager, Billy. Oh, interesting. Now we never asked Monica about that. If she right. knew anything about that, and then that's when it tied into a story with Trump. Um, because what happened was um, Trump asked Big Billy to get Michael Jackson to, to come to one of his casinos. Yeah. And he wanted so much money, but he said that uh, Billy realized this guy's just a shyster, which we all know. I didn't need right. the book to read the book uh, to know that. <laughs> right. He just trying to rip him off. So he said he didn't want nothing to do with him. So, yeah. But that was an interesting story. But there's a lot of other good stories in the book, Billy. People should read it. It's definitely worth the read. Yeah. Um, he's the last of the last, Billy. The last of the, you know, the respected, you know, bosses, you know, a lot different than than the guys running things today. Yeah. Totally different era. And, uh, you know, this was a different time period, Billy. Right, yeah. And it, I heard rumors that they're going to be making a movie on this. Interesting. Which would be, yeah, it would be interesting. It would make a very good movie. Yeah, yeah. It'd make a very good movie. You know, yeah. But just the stories, you know, that story with Carla Gambino was incredible. You yeah. understand the power Buffalino has, and then the thing, sure. whole thing with Frankie Sheeran, and, and you know, and Jimmy Hoffa, and then you know, kind of changed my mind on it. Yeah, I still think though, maybe Sheeran, they might have told Sheeran, "Hey, listen, we want to talk to Jimmy. We're gonna have a meeting. You got to get him from that restaurant. He's not gonna come out." And then Sheeran, right. and then maybe that's why he was so mad, Billy. Yeah. Yeah. Said, you know, they never told him what they were going to do. And that's why he won't, you know, he was the two Tonys were worried he's going to take them out. Mm. Shows you a lot, shows you a lot about Sheeran, though, how because a lot of people, 
you know, they say when they say that Sheeran was lying about that and the whole book and this and that, they say that he really wasn't involved in stuff. And that's not true at all. He was he was very close with Buffalino and Hoffa. Right, right. He did a lot of dirty work. He was the guy that, you know, Buffalino went to as enforcement. Oh, and the one thing I wanted to mention, I said I mentioned at the end, um, at the end of when Sheeran gets out of prison, um, he was basically having a lot of health problems. He was older, couldn't be as active as he was. He was still intimidating, though, because everybody knew the legend. Sure. Sheeran. He wasn't the same guy, but Billy liked him and he felt sorry for him. So he took him along with him and he would take him with him on the day when he was going to collections or whatever, meeting different people. He would take Sheeran with him to make him feel important. Right. Important. And a lot of times what he would do was if he was meeting somebody, he'd just drop Sheeran off at the bar because Sheeran was a notorious drinker. Yeah. Uh, this guy could drink like Andre the Giant. You know? <laughs> and yeah. So what happened was Sheeran had told him that, look, I'm going to, I got an offer to write this book and I want to write this book so I could make some money and have something to leave to my family that, you know, I basically, you know, ruined their lives, you know, so I want to leave them something. Right. And Billy said, okay. And then he said, there's, there's, you know, there's going to be offers to make a movie about it too. And Billy said, okay, I'll let you do it on two Two um things you have you have to two two things that are vital that you have to do. Yeah. And he said, number one is you got to keep my name out of the book in the movie. I don't right. want to mention, and he wasn't. He's not mentioned in uh, I heard you paint houses. He's not mentioned in uh the movie at all. Right. The other thing is I don't want none of this stuff to come out until after uh Russ Buffalino's wife passes away. Because mm. she was older, she was still alive, and he says, I don't want heard of they have to read any of this stuff or yeah. see a movie about it i don't want it to happen right but what happened was the book came out before she died mm. it, so billy was aggravated he was really mad about that but he didn't he didn't feel there was any need to really try to you know do anything to share into that because at this point the guy was really in bad health you know he he was older but he said just you know he did keep my name out of it yeah so now, but he said the reason now Billy wrote his book, this book here, is because he knew that Frankie Sheeran didn't kill Jimmy Hoffa. And when he said he did, just to make more money, to make the book look good, this is what he said. You know what? I'm going to come out with a book. Everybody's mm -hmm. got a book. Everybody's talking. And yeah. the thing is, Billy didn't rat on anybody. And he didn't, there's nothing in the book like most of the people. <coughs> that he did talk about a lot they're dead anyway sure so there's nobody that could be there's nobody that could be convicted by by anything right. that he said in his book so kind of different than a lot of the other books that people come out and he and again he didn't try to put himself in the anything that like the kennedy assassination or Marilyn monroe like right. that book double cross he didn't try any of that nonsense yeah that's why i think the book is credible yeah interesting and yeah. i'll also say on patreon when we do the patreon episode about this i'll say why another reason why i think this book is credible i'm just not going to say it now but i'm going to say i'll say on the patreon okay you know so <clears throat> anyway i think a lot of people should go out there check it out get it off our bookshop yeah what's worth it billy you too buddy yeah yeah definitely yeah i will uh, you know you know all the spare time i have sean too <laughs> I, I know. I, had I got so many. I got so many books that people send me. Bill Arthur sent me. They want to come on her show. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Pease just sent me a book. She wants me to read. Yeah. We we'll try to read that one. Uh, but I got. We got guests coming up. I got to read a lot of their stuff. So I mean, it's it's hard. I know it's hard to find the yeah. time. Yep. But this is right. a quick read, Billy. It's not. It's not. It's only like a couple hundred pages, maybe three hundred pages, and. As long as there's pictures in there and there's pictures in there, Billy. <laughs> pictures in the back. That's good. That's good, Sean. All right. Well, this was good. A good episode. And uh, you know, definitely sign up if you want the the rest of the story, as they say. Definitely sign up for our Patreon, and you'll get that uh, that episode also. Yeah, because we got a lot of good stuff, Billy, to say that I, I'm yeah. not going to say on this episode, but I'll save yeah. it for Patreon. A lot of good stuff. All right. Sounds good. All right, Sean. Well. Good episode, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. And that's all right. Good night, everybody. 
That's Enough Out of You podcast is executive produced and written by Bill Rader and Sean Kane and edited by Bill Rader. The That's Enough Out of You podcast and logo are exclusive property of Bags of Chicken, LLC. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or accounts of this podcast without the express written consent of Bags of Chicken, LLC is prohibited. So don't even try it.